Okay, so this next part that we're going to talk about is not in your notes. So please, please, whatever you do, write it down. Write it down on a sheet of paper, put it here with your notes, because this is not in your notes. Okay, so I love your textbook, but this is actually one area that your textbook does not do a good job. So we just went over how to draw Lewis structures, how to... Uh, you know, assign formal charges, what resonance is, all that good stuff. But there are exceptions to everything that we just talked about. So what I want to do is talk about two specific uh, instances where they, they definitely violate what I just talked about. So the first one that I want to talk about is what happens when you have a Lewis structure that violates the octet rule. Okay, so that's going to be the first thing that we're going to talk about. The second thing I want to talk about after after we talk about violating the octet rule, what happens if you have an odd number of electrons? Okay, so those are the two things that I want to talk about that definitely, they definitely happen. You should be aware of it just in case if it comes up. So that way you're good. So let's talk about violating the octet rule. All right, so let's say you've got a compound like this. You've got a compound that says, uh, let's, let, let's try this one, ICl4 minus. Okay, well, both of, the, both of these atoms are going to be non-pol, uh, they're going to be they're, they're going to be halogens, so they're in group 7. So we want to count up the number of electrons just like we normally do. So in this case, um, iodine, you've got one of those times 7 electrons. So that's bringing over 7. Chlorine, you've got four of those times 7 valence electrons. You've got 28. And then you're adding one extra in for the negative charge. So that's going to give you 8 plus... 8 plus 28, that's going to get you 36 electrons. All right, so that's how many electrons we're working with. Because uh, we're going to try to put the one that accepts the most number of bonds in the middle. In this case, iodine is going to be in the middle because you got four chlorines. So I'm going to put iodine in the middle, and I'm going to put four chlorines around the iodine. And what I'm going to do is make a bond between iodine and those four chlorines. So now I want to make sure that everything on the outside follows octet, okay? So I'm going to put in my electrons, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. All right, so we've got 24 valence electrons accounted for, so that leaves us 12 electrons left, okay? We had how many bonds? Four bonds, so that's eight electrons. Okay, so now we've got four electrons left over. Where do those four electrons go? They've got to go in the central atom. So I'm going to put those in as a lone pair. All right, now if we were to calculate, if we do the formal charge thing on the iodine, okay, Iodine should have seven valence electrons in a, in, in normal state, okay, minus, we count up the number of non-bonding electrons, you got four non-bonding electrons, and then half of the bondings, okay, so half of two, four, six, eight, all right, so you got four electrons plus half of eight, which is four, four plus four gives you eight, seven minus eight gives you negative one. So the iodine would carry the negative one charge. So that's it. There's going to be certain times where you are going to violate the octet rule. Period two elements will follow it, except for boron, because boron only wants six. But after that, period two follows the octet rule. Anything period three, you follow the normal rules. It's the central atom that's going to get the lone pairs. Okay. So uh, that's going to be very useful because the next topic, when we start talking about 3D structure, these lone pairs around the central atom count. So that's how you would deal with uh, atoms that violate the octet rule.
Okay. Second part. Let's say you got a compound like this. Okay. Uh, let me let me find one real quick. Do 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 do. Yep, I'm looking this up in the book, so you're hearing me flip through the page. Uh, what if you have like nitric oxide, like something like this? Okay, it's a neutral compound. If we are trying to draw the Lewis structure for this, nitrogen has five electrons. You got one of those, so it's bringing over five. For the oxygen, you got six electrons, one of those. So if you add those up, you got 11 electrons total. So if I draw the Lewis structure, okay, one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so you know most likely that you're going to have a bond that forms between these two, a bond that forms between those two. So you should have a double bond, something like this. Okay. And then you're going to have one extra electron that's left over. Okay. This does happen from time to time. So it is possible that you could have a Lewis structure that has an extra electron in there. It does happen. It's pretty rare. Okay. When this happens, we call these radicals. Okay. These are, these are really reactive co compounds. And this is actually part of what you're going to look at in organic chemistry. These radicals will keep reacting until there's no more reactant. Either you've made all product or there's no more reactants to generate these radicals. But once you form a radical, you got to get rid of it somehow. Some way, shape, or form, you got to find a way to get rid of it. But yeah, those are the main two things that's going to come up in your notes or in a table in, in, your, in your homework. You can have compounds that violate the octet rule, and then once in a while you will come across compounds that do have an odd number of electrons. It's going to be pretty rare. In fact, when I make up your homework assignments, I'm going to try to steer you away from any of these radical things. But violating the octet rule, that's definitely, definitely fair game. The last topic in this chapter that I want to cover that kind of ties up a lot of loose ends is something that uh, we go back to, it feels like a long time ago, but we talked about enthalpy, and I said when we were talking about enthalpy that there's two, there's three ways to calculate it. We could calculate it directly by looking up the enthalpies of formation. We can calculate enthalpy indirectly using Hess's law, and I said that there's a third way. We'll talk about it later. Well, that moment's come, so let's talk about the third way of calculating enthalpy. So the way that we can do this is to calculate something called its bond enthalpy, which is the enthalpy change required to break a particular bond in one mole of gaseous molecules. Okay, And we can measure bond enthalpies for pretty much any bond out there. So the rule of thumb is that it's going to take more energy to break a triple bond than it will a double bond, and it's going to take more energy to break a double than a single. Now, the table... This table that I'm providing in your notes, these values are all positive, okay, because it's going to take energy to break a bond. So these are all endothermic values, okay. To calculate bond enthalpy, to calculate the enthalpy of a reaction using bond enthalpy is the way you would do this. I'm going to, get, I'm going to warn you, this is going to be different than the way you've done it before. What you're going to do is sum up all the bond dissociation enthalpies, okay? So it's these values, the BDEs, bond dissociation enthalpies of the reactants minus the sum of all the bond dissociation enthalpies of your products. So anytime that we've calculated the change in something, it was the output minus the input. This time it's completely the opposite. You're taking the input and subtracting it from the output. Okay, so these are a little, this is completely different from what you saw previously. All right, so that being said, let's try a problem out. Now, this is kind of cool. What we're going to do is actually calculate this, the enthalpy of a reaction two different ways. One way using the direct method, <clears throat> and then another way using the, uh, using the bond enthalpy way. 
So here we go. Calculate the enthalpy of the following reaction using bond enthalpies and then the enthalpies of the formation. So what's kind of cool is that if we do this right, the values should be really close to each other. Okay, so let's try this out. Let's do this using bond enthalpies first. Okay, so if we do this using bond enthalpies, you've got a hydrogen bonded to a hydrogen. You've got fluorine bonded to fluorine. And then you've got two of these HFs, okay? So what we want to do is look at that chart and look up hydrogen bonded to hydrogen. And there it is. It's uh, the, our first value, 436.4 kilojoules per mole. Okay. Uh, you got fluorine bonded to fluorine. I'm going to circle that value. So that's 156.9 kilojoules per mole. And then HF with HF, uh, there it is. I'm going to circle that value. So it was 568.2, 568.2. So I'll write two of those. All right. All right. So now to calculate this, we're going to add up the input. We've got the, the output. Add up the outputs. And then we'll subtract the one from the other. So if we take, uh, if we use that equation, let's write that out. So the change in enthalpy of the reaction is going to be the sum of the bond dissociation enthalpies of the reactants minus the sum of the bond dissociation enthalpies of the products. Okay. So for the reactants, you've got the hydrogen bonded to hydrogen. So 436.4 kilojoules per mole plus 156.9 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so that's your product. I mean, that's your reactants. We're going to subtract that from the products 568.2 kilojoules per mole plus 568.2 kilojoules per mole. We're doing that twice because you got two moles. All right, so 436. Let me grab a calculator here. So if you've got 436.4 plus 156.9, that should give you 593.3 kilojoules per mole. And then we're going to subtract that from the total of the products, 568.2 plus 568.2, so minus 1136.4. If you notice, the, the products is bigger, so th this is going to give us a minus sign. So let's see, 593.3 minus 1136.4, that should give us a negative 5. 43.1 kilojoules per mole. All right, so that is going to be the enthalpy of the reaction using the bond enthalpies. All right, so the next question, how do we calculate this using, uh, using the enthalpies of formation? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back and erase these values since we got them from the table. You saw where these values came from. Okay. All right, they're all gone. All right, so let's try this again. We want to do this using the enthalpies of formation, but if you guys remember, anytime you're dealing with an with a compound that's in its elemental state, like H2, its enthalpy of formation is zero. So H2 is going to have an enthalpy of formation of zero. F2 is going to have an enthalpy of formation of zero. So now it's really coming down to whatever that value of HF is. And so we got to look up this value. I did not have this down, so I've got to actually look this up in a table. Okay. So HF, uh, all right, HF, the heat of formation for HF is going to be a negative 271 kilojoules per mole. So, if you remember how we calculate these, uh, we're going to take the enthalpy of 
the reaction. This is going to be equal to the products minus the reactants. So the reactants is already going to be zero, so that part drops out. The products it was negative 271 times 2 because you had two moles of that. So negative 271 times 2 should give us negative 542 kilojoules per mole. So that comes out very, very, very close to the value that we got. We're off by about a, a kilojoule. So what's kind of nice is that this gives you a third way to calculate the enthalpy of a reaction.